Hello and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great as always to be here with you. I'm flying solo this week due to Paul having some heavy work commitments, um, a pretty common sort of pitfall of the touring rock god. So miss you, Paul, but we'll battle on without you. Um, I'd also like to give a very quick shout out to our gold and silver supporters, the Core Chrome Music Group on Facebook and the musicplayer.com keyboard forums. Links to the websites of each are in our show notes. Thank you for your support. We do appreciate it. We'd also love if you could click on the subscribe button if you're look, looking at this on YouTube and the little bell if consuming this um, helps you get through the day. Also, don't forget our offer to wear your band's T-shirt on the show. So I'm very pleased today to wear... Um, Leaning back, Jake Clemens's T-shirt, not because he's um, actually sent me one because I like Jake Clemens, but we are keen to, whether it's a cover band, original band, we are keen to promote it. So do contact us um, via the website, keyboardchronicles.com, and we'll set something up. But uh, let's get to our guest this week. So uh, once again, it's a pleasure to introduce someone great to the show. In this episode, it's Mike Schmid. Now, Mike's had an incredible career to date of coming up to sort of more than 20 years. And amongst other things, he's the touring keyboard player with Miley Cyrus, as you'll hear. Um, add to that to his work with everyone from Troy Savan to Cheryl Crow in his own burgeoning solo career. And you have one busy keyboard player, to say the least. Um, so he's just come off a tour of South America and he's kindly joined us to talk on a range of topics, which I think you enjoy. So let's get into it. Mike, can't thank you enough for joining us. And um, have you gotten over the jet lag yet? Yeah, I think so. They say that it's uh, an hour for every, what is it? An every hour of time difference. It's a day to recover. So yeah, I think I'm pretty much recovered at this point. From Excellent. So, I mean, I know you've been back a few days and you've had um, a, a South American tour. I think, what, six or seven countries, something like that? Uh, yeah, it was actually five, but we okay. ended up only doing four because we weren't able to land in one of them. Okay. So, and I, I have seen um, on the news that you had an eventful tour. Tell us about um, some of your fun plane trips on the tour. Uh, <laughs> well, so because it was all very close together time-wise, uh, we, we did it on a jet um, and we were fortunate to have like a really nice new jet from like last, I think it was built last year. It was like a 327 or something like that, um, which was great. But then <laughs> at a certain point in the tour, we got stuck in a lightning storm and uh, <laughs> it was really funny because I was actually texting with my wife. I showed her a, a picture of where I was sitting on the plane and she was like, oh, that's the safest spot to be right by the wing there. And then uh, while we were up there, we were in this lightning storm and we were going to land in Paraguay and they basically had us circle and we were circling through the storm which i thought you know they would move us over a little bit or something but no so we're going through this lightning storm over and over and over and it seems very close and then we hear a, an extra loud clap of thunder and i noticed that the wing that i'm sitting right next to has been struck by lightning uh and it's like basically fibers of metal are sticking out of the wing at this point and um you know planes are meant to be able to withstand that so it wasn't i mean it was terrifying but it wasn't the most i knew that we were going to survive it but you know people were like rocking back and forth and saying like don't throw up don't throw up um but basically we had to do an emergency landing instead of landing in paraguay we had to land um it was like 150 miles outside of asuncion um and so yeah it was just kind of one of those weird trips where like <laughs> then for the rest of that ride like for our entire tour i would look out the window and i would see where they put the speed tape on the the spot that got struck by lightning and i was like this is you know my assigned seat right by the wing that got hit the tape, tape can fix everything mike as you know whether it's on yeah, stage apparently. or on a plane it can fix everything <laughs> no that that would have made what would be an eventful tour anyway very eventful so yeah glad you all got back safely thank you so um so mike um I, We'll obviously talk a lot about um, just the recent tour and your 10 plus years with Miley Cyrus and so on, but let's just talk a little bit about you firstly. So tell us about your sort of development in music. What got you started in, in music in the early years and, um, you know, what were the inspirations for you to, to devote a career to it? Well, I, my, my parents put me in lessons when I was five and I think I was pretty 
bored with it at first. I don't think I really enjoyed it very much, but they were kind of, they were the kind of parents that kind of tried everything. So I was in little league, I was in wrestling, I was in, you know, and it became clear over time that sports was kind of not the way for me. Uh, and so, you know, the first few years, I think I was probably playing songs with like three notes, you know, very, very elementary stuff. And then it, it became obvious after a certain point that I had an aptitude for it. Um, and my ear grew very quickly. Um, and I, at a certain point, became kind of like a party trick. I was like the, you know, the guy who would like play classical and like do do this stuff and, you know, play behind his back. And uh, I I would do perfect pitch party tricks where <laughs> I'd be like, you know, in another room and someone would play a note and I would have to tell them which note they're playing and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it kind of became my thing, you know, became wrapped up in my identity. I was playing for like 11 choirs in our churches and schools and all that stuff. And it became like almost a full-time job during school. Um, so I eventually went to Berklee College of Music uh, in Boston for my, my college career. And initially, uh, I thought I was going to be a classical pianist, but then I realized that, you know, there's really like, if, unless you're one of the five best in the entire planet, you're pretty much not going to make a career out of that. Um, so, you know, I, once I went to Berkeley, my initial songwriter or my initial major was um, film scoring and music synthesis as a double major, uh, which was ambitious. And I also basically I went to a film scoring class and they were showing a scene between a man and a woman sitting at a table like having dinner um, and they showed it scored several different ways. One way made it feel very sinister, like he had plans for her. Another way felt like a light romantic comedy and they, they were just basically showing us all the different things that music could do to a scene. And instead of being inspired by that, like the second I saw that, I was like, oh, oh, I don't want to do film scoring. <laughs> this is way, way too much responsibility for someone else's baby, you know? So I actually changed my major that day uh, to songwriting. So I actually have a degree in songwriting which is, you know, not a piece of paper you can really show people and, and get any work from, but it's, it's what my degree is. Um, I, since then, have rekindled my love for film scoring, but yeah, I, I ran screaming from it at that point. Oh, and I was about to say, Mike, maybe we'll jump to that now. So you've actually done some film scoring and TV work, I believe. I have, yeah, and I've done a lot of licensing of my own music for that kind of stuff. Um, I'm actually working on a short film right now uh, with a friend of mine about the dairy industry. And uh, so, you know, it's, it, I just kind of do a little bit of whatever's coming towards me. So over the, oh my goodness, my career is now uh, 25 years or something. Um, it's just kind of like whatever is needed that day, you know? So it's like, if someone needs a score, you do that. If someone needs you to mix something, you do that. If someone needs a session thing, you do that. And aside from the financial necessity of that, Mike, um, you said, you know, it's rekindled for you. Is it your confidence as a musician and just your, the length of your career that now makes you feel you can take responsibility for putting music over other people's work? Uh, maybe. I think, honestly, I think I still have the same, all the same self-doubt and the same, you know, imposter syndrome and all those same things I had when I was 20. Um, I guess the difference is I just know how normal that is now. Like, I know how many other artists who I respect and love and like, you know, people who are making incredible film scores are also going in there like, well, who am I to do this? You know, like, that's just what it is every day. At least for me, I know there are people who have like unbridled confidence and I'm very happy for them, but I don't relate to that. <laughs> no, no, I can you totally know? understand that. So no, that's excellent. So, and so obviously you finished um, your studies at Berkeley. So what was the next step for you after that? Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so I graduated with a degree in songwriting and you have this piece of paper and you're like, who wants to hire me? And there's crickets. Um, basically, I, I flew to, uh, to L.A. right after I graduated, knowing f pretty much nobody. I, I flew out here with like three friends um, and, you know, we weren't exactly like we're going to take over the music industry or anything like that. We were kind of like, I hope I hope it's OK to be out here. Um, I was actually so we flew out on a on a flight from Boston to LA and I was just getting really fed up with Boston. I was like done, I was ready to go. So I actually switched my flight to a week earlier 
Um, and I flew out to Boston or to LA from Boston. And then I was supposed to be on the flight on 9-11 that flew into either the Pentagon or the, the Trade Center. I can't remember which one it was, the Boston LA flight. Um, but so I was watching that happen from a floor of my friend's house in LA thinking like that was my flight. And if I hadn't been so just like done with Boston and ready to get out, I would have been on that flight. You know, my impatience made me come a week earlier. What, so what I sort of impact did that have on you, Mike? So I know you can read too much into these things, but that is pretty intense. Like, you know, it's one of the most, you know, well-known flights in history for all the wrong reasons. But it, yeah. it, what impact did that have on you at the time? Well, and you're right. You can read all kinds of meanings into things yeah. like that. Um, I just... I don't know. I didn't have like a big grand thing of like, well, I guess I'm being saved for some reason. So I got to do something really special with my, I didn't have that like, you know, flash, but it just kind of felt like, I don't know. I, yeah. I, it's, I haven't really put enough meaning to it <laughs> probably as it deserves. Yeah, it's just but, a sliding doors moment, I suppose. It's just, yeah, ways there's around. ways it could have gone and it's, I guess the fact that like my life could have been over before I even started my career, it does kind of make me think like, well, I gotta, I gotta really enjoy this. You know, I gotta really like put everything into it. But again, it's like, I guess there's a way to look at it. That would have been an incredibly enlightening, life-changing thing. And I just was kind of like, that was supposed to be my flight. Oh my God. And that was kind of the end of it. But yeah. yeah. It's and, and I mean, curious. so you've arrived in LA and um, yeah, how did you start exploring the scene? Well, I would have to say that I wasted several years. Um, that whole thing about youth is wasted on the young. I think about that often because I was like 21 when I moved to LA and I didn't know anybody. So we, you know, I didn't know what you do to start. I didn't know what I wanted to start doing. You know, I, I knew that I could play the piano and I knew that I had a d degree in songwriting. And I was like, I guess I'll just start like writing my own songs and releasing them. My actually my senior project in college was an album. So I had this really cool class uh, at Berkeley in my final semester with um, this guy named Grayson Hugh, who's like a, a folk songwriter. And it, it was, I don't even know what the class was called. I don't remember anymore, but it was literally just like a private lesson where I would sit down with him every week. And over the course of a semester, like he would advise me on how to like create an album and you know, how to flesh out a song and how to flesh out instrumentation and, and then what to do for mixing and mastering and all that stuff, like the whole process. And so by basically my senior project at the end of that year was to put out my, my debut solo album so and and it was kind of just something i did as like a a school project you know and i brought like string players into my dorm room and like i don't know if you remember in the late 90s computers were really loud so there's like you know tracks upon tracks of strings on this record if you listen real closely you'll hear like lots of computer sounds stacked terrible um you know i would have done it all very differently now but um yeah, so I knew that I wanted to write songs and I knew that I wanted to, to be an artist and and play as well. And I also knew at this point that I didn't want to be a classical pianist, um, but that I, I loved the training of that, you know, but it was not really like a way that was going to be very fruitful for me. So I got to LA and I, I guess I did some open mics and, you know, I spent the first few years kind of just going out and trying to meet people and um, I eventually found my way into a crowd of, of friends who were also singer songwriters and we formed like a, a singer songwriter collective type thing where we would get together once a month. And I, I think because of that class I had at Berkeley, I realized how important it was to have challenges to set for myself and to have a community of people to say like, Hey, why don't we do this thing next? Or, you know, um, so yeah, we would meet once a month and we would, set assignments for each other and we'd say like hey so how about for next month we write a protest song and everybody would go home and write a protest song of different sorts and then the next meeting we'd all sit together and play them for each other and um and it was great it was i feel like i grew a lot as a songwriter during that time um but 
you know, who's to say if anything was happening with my career at that point? I don't know. I think it was all building towards something. Um, but I just started doing sessions with other songwriters. And uh, that was kind of what I did for the first few years while also recording my own albums. And then at some point, I got a, uh, I got a phone call. I was going through a is we're skipping ahead quite a bit but i was going through a brutal divorce <laughs> uh this was i was 27 and i got a phone call from a friend of mine who was like um he was like do you know who hannah montana is and i being a a 20 something grown up was like uh no i don't think so um and this was like right when the show had just started um it was in i think season two and he was like well it's billy ray cyrus's daughter she's going on a tour um, they think it's going to be huge. And I was like, okay, I was like just getting through this divorce. And I was like, I need to get out of the house, you know? And so it was not something I had not really thought about being a side man. It wasn't something I was like looking into doing. Cause I, I had this paradigm for myself at this point about being a solo artist and you know, you're, you're on that track. Um, but again, it was like, I needed to get out of the house. It sounded like good pay and it sounded like fun, new experiences for me. So they said it was all arenas and I had never played an arena in my life. I had been on many van tours, you know, I'd done lots of like back killing, you know, hotel or motel tours and stuff. Um, so I was like, all right, well, sure. It's four months of my life. It'll get me out of the house. It sounds great. And so it was a total different experience for me to go on a tour like this um the the first trial by fire um was that they weren't even they i guess had already auditioned a lot of people to be the keyboard player for miley and they hadn't found anybody that they liked and they had somebody who was um i think she was an actress and she was kind of like just she was kind of like playing the role for a little while until they found somebody um but they had auditioned the entire band. They brought everybody in. And the only person they hadn't found was a keyboard player. And something I discovered was that like the higher levels of the entertainment business, there oftentimes is no audition. You know, it's like a lot of times it's just so-and-so asks their friend, hey, who do you vouch for? And then they say this guy, and then they bring that, this guy in. And so that was kind of what happened here. Like I had been playing all these sessions with singer songwriters and this producer that I worked with on on several albums, including my own, um, just was like, hey, I know a keyboard player and threw my name in and basically to his studio buddy who I had not yet met with who was putting the tour together. And so they they called me and they were like, OK, so do you have any keyboards? And I said at this point, this is the worst possible answer. I said at this point, it was 2007. I literally just sold all my keyboards because I decided to move to an all plug-in setup in my studio. You know, this was when it was all really just starting to right happen with plugins in the, um, and I was using Logic and I was just like, I had just sold literally all of my keyboards. So he said, well, it's Friday. The first rehearsal is on Monday. There are 38 songs you have to learn. And he's like, so you're gonna need to get some keyboards, learn the keyboards, and learn the songs and come in ready on Monday morning. So like I spent like Friday night researching all the keyboards that were currently out, you know, and then I spent Saturday, I like went to Guitar Center and I, I got what I could afford at the time, which was like a small Juno and an Alesis Micron. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Yeah, I still have that Micron actually. Um, but yeah, that little tiny thing, I think my whole rig probably cost me like 1700 bucks or something like that. I, and I was like, you know, I still didn't really have like steady work. So that was a lot for me. Um, and then I spent Saturday and Sunday learning 40 Disney songs <laughs> that I had never heard before and programming them all on these keyboards that I didn't know how to use yet. Um, and basically I just showed up on the first day with everything ready to go. And I, you know, in my mind, again, it's this imposter syndrome mindset. I showed up like, oh my gosh, I probably have to like prove that I belong here and that I can do this. And like, and it's like in my head, that's what I'm doing. I'm proving to everyone I can do this. But in everyone else's head, they're like, here's the guy they got, you know? And it's like, there was, it wasn't like it was an audition or anything like that. No one was like, well, we may have to get rid of this guy, you know? But in my head, the whole time I was just like, 
I gotta, I gotta prove that I belong here, you know? And so I just showed up knowing the songs and no one ever really asked any questions and I'm still there now. Right, which is <laughs> great. Was, that was like almost 15 years ago. Wow. And, and, and so for those that didn't have kids at the time that Hannah Montana was big and I did. So I, I literally, <laughs> Mike have Hannah Montana songs still on my iTunes, my Apple music wow. application. And one of the reasons I do is because I am sentimental for those days, but also B, they are actually quite good rock songs, some of them. So, I, you know, there is a lot of children's music out there that does treat children like children. This stuff, and obviously this was more about teens than children, but they're really good rock songs. Yeah, I was surprised by that too. Like when yeah. I first got hired for this, I didn't know what to expect. And, I, you know, there's interesting modulations. There's like, there's they're well-structured. They're, the lyrics are good. It's like, I really enjoyed playing them. I mean, yeah. and we did uh, on that first tour, that best of both worlds tour. I don't know how many dates we did, but upwards of 70, I think. And those songs were still fun to play at the end, you know, like, so I think that says a lot for it that. Does. That and, kind and of machine music. It does. And it's, and it's obviously a testament to you that you're still going 15 years later. So how's that relationship grown as far as it just, is it sim simply a matter, Mike, of you're doing a great job everyone's happy so you're just kept on or is it a matter of continuing to build that relationship and and have you needed to feel like you've proved yourself as you've gone on i think yeah i think it's a little bit of both um you know early on i, I feel like we were all just kind of like riding this rocket and we were kind of like no one knew it was going to be as big as it was that first tour i think all the dates in the u.s sold out within five seconds of releasing them <laughs> Um, and so when we saw that, that was before we went out, obviously, that was our first indicator that like, okay, this is bigger than I thought it was. I, you know, I knew that there were Disney Channel shows. I knew there was like Lizzie McGuire and that kind of stuff at the time. And, but I didn't realize like that you could do an arena tour for this, you know? Um, and that was really like the beginning of, we started seeing a lot of that. Cause like the, our opener on that tour was the Jonas Brothers. You know, and then they became a juggernaut and Disney has this thing they do where they piggyback and it's it's so perfect. Like they're obviously they know what they're doing business wise. Um, but yeah, it was it was interesting because at a certain point we were just on this ride and we kind of didn't know how we got here. Like everyone in the band, we're all just like, wow, this is a thing that's bigger than us, you know. Um, but so, yeah, over time, I feel like our relationship with Miley grew a lot. And, you know, she was also a kid. She was 13 when we started with her and we were all really into what we were into. And so we were playing a lot of music for her. And I think a lot of that informed the kind of music that she's into now, which is, you know, exciting because we get to play a lot of things we love with her. You know, like we were playing the cardigans for her in like 2009 and she was super into it and it's like now we'll cover the cardigans sometimes and like just things that feel a little bit obscure um is what she's into now you know and it's not i'm not saying i'm not taking credit for her taste entirely <laughs> but it was interesting kind of with her growing up playing music and then we were able to kind of bring in influences in certain ways and it does feel like even though she's very much her own artist, absolutely. Um, it does feel like we've all grown as a band together um, in a way that like a band band would grow. And we've all influenced each other. She's influenced us like musically, we've all influenced each other. There's a certain kind of chemistry I feel like in this band now after 15 years that is just so easy. Like we can literally whip something up and you know, we can play through a song we've never heard before, listen to it once, play it once, and it's pretty much performance ready, but it also has some interesting, you know, juice from each of us in it. And like, th that's a really special place that I feel like we've gotten to that it's taken a lot of time to get to. And so I'm really excited about that. Absolutely. And, and so do you feel because you are relatively close knit as a, a band and Mike, I haven't seen, I assume that your personnel haven't changed a lot over the 15 years it sounds, you might've had the odd person swap in and out, but essentially the same group. Well, so there's, there's three of us, our core members who have been there since the beginning. Um, one, our guitarist, one of our guitarists, uh, Jocko, he recently um, 
he went over to Kelly Clarkson's TV show because she's, you know, it's a very nice steady gig. Um, and I think he was just going to do that for a while, but it really took off. So, um, so yeah, he's not with us anymore. We have another guy, um, Max Bernstein, who's incredible, who's taken his place. And then our bass player left a few years back and we have like a kind of rotating chair there <laughs> where it's just never been the same person. Well, okay, it's been the same person a few times, but we have a few people that we kind of rotate between, one of which is uh, uh, Chris Cheney from Jane's Addiction. And, uh, you know, we have this guy, Joe Ayub, who plays in the American Idol band. And, you know, just kind of, we switch out. And we got we got uh, Josh Moreau from Katy Perry's band. So it's like, it just depends on availability. But the fact that the three core members are still there, our band leader is still the same person, and everything trickles down from him. You know, and he and Miley get along incredibly well, you know, and speak the same language and we all kind of speak the same language. And I feel like that's really made things move quickly, you know, but lately we've had like a brass section and we've had new background singers and we've added a percussionist. And so we have this like huge, almost Vegas like version of the show at this point. And do you feel that the fact that that has knitted together so well is because unlike a a let's uh, use um, Jane's Addiction as an example, that a, a band is a battle of the egos. I've been in enough bands to know that their band's a battle of egos, but in the sort of band you're playing in, there is only one focus and that's the artist, which is, for, is Miley. So do you find that it takes a lot of the ego out about the rest of you needing to back Miley? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I also find that it takes a lot of the pressure off um, because as a solo artist, I find it terrifying to play shows. I really don't enjoy playing my solo music solo, you know? And so even just when I'm playing my music, having people up there as a band with me takes pressure off. But knowing that no one is looking at me, like when I'm playing with Miley, I can be in a room of 30,000 people and know that not one of them is looking at me right now. <laughs> and there's something about that that's incredibly relaxing. But like no matter how nervous you possibly could be you just you're kind of a part of a big machine and you know just keep the machine running do your your bit well and you know people are only going to notice if you completely mess it up you know that's right i've, I've never done a survey mike but i, I guarantee 70 or 80 percent of keyboard players love being in a back corner helping drive the band and not being seen i know that's my preference yes, that's mine too yeah that that wizard of oz Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. That's like That's my, right. my favorite and, place to be. And speaking of behind the curtain, just while we're on this, so obviously like Miley, Katy Perry, Pink, all these major artists, These for those of our, our older listeners that haven't been to one of these shows, it's hard to overstate how much of a production they are. They are a massive, impressive, incredible production so i haven't seen miley live i've seen Katy perry live and it blew my mind just the level of, of of production how do you keep things for yourself fresh mike in that you're as you said one small cog in a very big production how do you keep things fresh for yourself on a, a long tour well there's still that element of every show is different even when it's kind of on rails and it's time coded and there's the same gags every day and we've done shows with her where she's like flying on a motorcycle and where she's on a big golden car and there's elevators and there's people in furry costumes and you know but even though everything is so choreographed she is very in the moment every day um and so we always are reacting to her and then also like one thing i love about our band is that it is it's more of a rock focused, like even when we were a Disney act, it was still a little more of a rock band than, than like just pop with tracks. Like it's always, we're trying to carry everything off live, not have lots of playback going on, you know? And, and so there is an element of us playing off each other and like, you know, listening and it doesn't feel entirely canned, which helps a lot, you know? And we, like, how after halfway through the tour you started adding this little melody that you embellish on every night now a little further you know without getting completely to the point of like freeform jazz odyssey by the end of the tour but you know what i mean um it, just being able to kind of like play off each other and enjoy the organic way a song is maybe moving during a tour um but also miley's really good at uh like when we did the bangers tour uh, in 2013 we had a whole separate stage that in the middle of the show 
we would go to that stage for anywhere from 15 to sometimes 45 minutes and just play covers and play whatever she was into that day. Like she would be on the plane and she'd say, I was listening to Irma Thomas today and I want to do this song. And we're like, who's Irma Thomas, you know? And so, but it's like, it would always be interesting things that she would bring in, you know? And some, some days it would be like Joni Mitchell. Some days it would be Coldplay. It would be like whatever she's into that day. Um, but that was always different. So there was always this portion of the show in the middle that was sort of this, this, you know, malleable thing, which was really fun. And it was like acoustic. We were all playing different sets of instruments from our major, you know, main rig. Um, so things like that help a lot. I think that was added into the show after doing a few tours where she felt like, you know, oh, there's too many gags. There's too many, like, I have to go do this thing and then I have to hit this mark. And, then, and she wanted it to feel more organic. So I think building that into the show is really smart when you have a show. And, and they're very, I mean, having only seen live videos but uh, from the last tour, but they do, it's very much is a rock show. And I think Miley's rock credentials are beyond, you know, query now as much as, you know, she may have, you know, the teen artist and, and a country predilection there with, you know, things like Jolene and stuff like that. But her rock credentials, I think, just are beyond reproach. I think so too. And I think I think you're right that it's kind of like, over time that has been proven. I think there was a time where people really didn't believe in her as a singer because they just assume certain things about, you know, a female Disney artist or even just a Disney artist in general. Um, and it wasn't until we started doing like the backyard sessions and things like that, that were more organic where she was like, I mean, she, she plays with us in a room all the time and it sounds great. And so it's like to have to only publicly put forward things that are like these huge productions, people don't get to see that, like that she just sits down with a band and wails, you know? And so I think it wasn't until she started releasing videos like that, like we did that Jolene video, I don't even know when that was, 2011 or something like that. Um, that's when people were like, oh, there's no auto-tune there. There's no tracks there. There's no, you know, and it's like people needed time to see over and over again this person can actually sing. This person has artistic ability and also something to say and also an interesting aesthetic and, you know. And so now I think people know that because she spent many years doing whatever she wants. Um, and it's, it's great now because it feels like we can just play any song, you know, and just drop it into the show and people aren't like, oh my gosh, is that playback? Is that, you know, they're like, no, this is just her and her band doing this thing that they do. And, and the recreation of the covers are excellent. I mean, obviously the the album, <clears throat> excuse me, that came out last week is a is a covers album, and there's some incredible tracks on there. And you know, being the old guy, things like you know, like a prayer, great version, rocky version, love it. Like there's just yeah, she's really established her credentials there. Yeah, yeah, and so that's actually that album is was from one live show that we did uh, at the Staples Center um, in January, I believe, of this year, and then. I know that they're, well, I, I think I'm not supposed to say certain things, so I won't say certain things, um, but she loves releasing live music and she loves like, you know, inserting new covers and surprising people and doing things like that. So and I, I will put in our show notes for our, our watchers and listeners. Um, there's an amazing performance, even just things like Billy Idol and Rebel Yell at an iHeart radio show. I, I can, I, constantly watching that video every few weeks just because of the performance aspect but again the voice it's just yeah. incredible yeah yeah absolutely and it's also the bonus is we've gotten to play with people like billy idol and joan jett and you know all these incredible artists that she idolizes you know that are from our wheelhouse as well like that are from the same time period that we grew up you know that's right so and there's so a lot of I was going to say, Mike, and there's got to be some downsides, though, Mike. So what, what do you find the challenging parts of playing at the scale of those huge performances? You know, it doesn't have to be anything significant, but just what do you find challenging? I mean, definitely it can get a little bit, uh, like when you're playing rock clubs, every room feels so different, you know, and you're packed in with all these people sweating and you see everyone's face and you feel the energy in the room and it's different every night. But that's the, the thing about these arena shows is that like, it does start to feel a little bit impersonal. And because it's like the, the energy in an arena is kind of always gonna be a wall of screening. 
and you know like it, it is what it is and it's fun to play for that many people and there's a certain level of energy that is special to that but it's also like once you've done that for several months tonight in iowa is not going to feel that different from last night in wherever you know so that you kind of have to find your own ways to amuse yourself or to mark the shows as different you know and sometimes crazy things will happen like a fan will jump on stage or some security thing will happen or whatever and you remember those shows because they feel like the, the outliers but oftentimes they do kind of blend together yeah no understood so let's talk about your rig just for a second, Mike, whether it's the one behind you or the one you do use on stage with Molly, or it could be the same thing. What, what, what do you go to boards? Okay, well, I got my Nord Stage 2 under here. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, you just oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, that's my bread and butter. I would say I use that on pretty much everything because I love, I love the Mellotron samples. I love that there's like a, a little basic synth section if I need it. But for pianos and, you know, roads, organs, all that stuff, like, I just feel like it covers all the bases. Um, and then I, I have my, uh, my Prophet 6 and my Prophet 12. So on the Miley gig, I use both of those. I use the, the Nord and both Prophets. Um, the Prophet 6, I use the most, I would say, because it's, it's not the Oberheim model, but it's the first one. I, I got it right when it came out. And I love this thing. I still use it all the time. I use it on the Chainsmokers tour. I use it with, uh, do you know Troy Savan, Australian artist? Yeah, I use it with him. Um, Cause it's got that that buttery sort of warm, it's perfect for like, you know, pads and cords and things like that. Um, and then I use the Prophet 12 on Miley because especially for that bangers era, it, ha it did a lot of that sort of like digital nastiness with the, it has a hack control and the, you know, all that stuff. Um, I also do the wrecking ball sound on there as well, um, which I, I programmed on there with LFOs and it just sort of worked and I've been using it ever since. And so now if we are doing wrecking ball, I kind of just always bring the 12 because it's, that's the best version of that sound I've programmed. So, um, so yeah, the six, the 12 and the stage. And then sometimes I use, uh, the uh, sub 37, the Moog, but that's usually more for leads and, you know, basses and stuff like that. And then I just recently got a native instruments just recently sent me their complete control oh, and, yeah. and I love it in the studio. I love it because it's like, you can really scroll through without having to load all these huge sample libraries and actually listen to samples of each thing before you load it. And just the workflow of like my computers over here, I'm going to turn over here. I, you know, I can look at this screen, but I don't have to be staring at my computer monitor so I can actually be thinking more musically and not, you know, visually as much. That's really right. helpful. And so you're a hundred percent hardware um, with those big shows, whether it's uh, Troy yes. or Milo. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Um, well, so it just depends on the show also, but what, like when I was doing Troy, um, I was running playback on that myself. So I had a redundant rig with two laptops on stage. I had my profits and, you know, my Nord and everything. And I was doing drum triggers and all kinds of other stuff. That to me is a nightmare. <laughs> like I love doing that tour, but I would always rather have hardware on stage and no software. Um, and I also, I would love to never do another gig of playback in my life because I find that when things like are out of my control like that, it's just, it's way more terrifying than me being worried about messing up my playing, you know, because like on Troy, there were places where we were in Europe in really hot clubs and stuff. And every time the temperature was at a certain level or above, the tracks would sort of skip forward just this like, randomly in the show at random moments would skip forward just enough to like desync from the drums and like and things like that like i could troubleshoot them forever but it really just came down to like being in a hot club and you know and so i show up with my nord and my profits and i know that they are midi connected to nothing <laughs> they're self-contained if anything goes wrong we have a backup of each keyboard you know it's not it's not the same level of anxiety for me. I think some people having main stage, you know, out there with them and, but I do not, I do not. No. I love Ableton. I love it in the studio. I don't want it on stage. 
<laughs> or is someone else running it on stage is fine with me, but I don't want to run it. Yeah, you be- because you become more of a technician than a musician when you're trying to trigger so much stuff. It's true. Yeah, it's true, and that can be fun too in a certain way, in a certain certain like circus dog with a bowl on its nose kind of way. But like, yeah, it starts to feel a little less musical and a little more mechanical. And so, yeah, I really like being able to just be there with you know in the world of my keyboards and just like no one needs to send me control changes i'll do that stuff myself like you know what i mean um and just know that like my nord has never crashed ever yeah. you know right. it's never frozen up it's never done anything weird unless it was hooked up to the computer <laughs> so so i know how you may answer this now mike it may not be anything to do with Milo or the other tours but more troy um usually we ask towards the end of the interview about your most memorable train wreck but now seems like a good time have you had a big technical disaster with actually with- so this this is funny because okay i have two that i want to share right uh, and they have nothing to do with what i just said <laughs> believe it or not they have nothing to do with using computers on stage um one of them <sighs> So I was using a keyboard that, uh, you know, they have those knobs that kind of click when you go to each sound. And I turned it most of the way, didn't realize it hadn't fully clicked over. So I turned it most of the way and I saw that it changed to the next sound. Um, And so it was on the climb, which is this ballad that Miley does at the end of her show. And it's like this big, powerful moment. And it starts with just piano playing fifths. And as I go to, play the the first chord i see it click over as my fingers are going down and i hit the keyboard and instead of a delicate piano it's the worst kind of 90s rave synth you've ever heard echoing throughout the arena miley turns around and looks at me as if i'm a crazy person because (laughs) what is that i was certain in that moment that i was going to be fired on the spot i was like ready for her to fire me during the show but we just we just stopped. I put the sound on and we started the song again and it was all fine. But that was like one of the most terrifyingly glaring, you know, moments of disaster for me. Just that horrible synth sound was, I would never use that sound in the first place. It was like a Reese or a Hoover or something. Anyway. Okay. And then the second one is I was, I'm not going to say who the brand was, but I was endorsing a certain brand of keyboard stands that happened to be, uh, how do I incriminate them least? <laughs> um, they they were very wobbly. And I always thought they were too wobbly. And I was playing a, a Phantom, what was it? It was a G8, which I don't know if you remember those things, but they were like tanks. Be, they were yeah. Like, yeah, this was in like probably 2009 or something. And that keyboard was, I don't remember, it was something like 80 or 90 pounds, I think. it was. We called it the Battleship. And so it was on this wobbly stand and I was like, I don't trust this, but blankety blank companies assures me that it's okay, that it's gonna be stable. It just moves a little bit. Well, during one of the shows on that tour, it was a Miley show and you know, it is a huge show. So there's all this stuff going on. My parents happened to be there that night watching the show. This was one of the like two or three shows of the entire tour they were gonna see. and the stand broke (laughs) and this heavy, this 80 pound keyboard came crashing down onto my legs uh, while I was playing the song. And it was a, you know, there was a fair amount of piano in this song. The techs are all jumping up on stage and helping me. And like, basically it's kind of crushed my legs at this point. Um, I'm sure it looked hilarious, (laughs) did not feel hilarious. I was fortunate enough not to have broken a bone or anything, but you know, all this is happening in the middle of the show. Miley's up on stage, my keyboard's on the ground, the stand is like sideways, you know, they're trying to get a backup keyboard and a backup stand and everything up there. And um, essentially we just plugged it all back in and continued. But the best part of that was, I asked my parents what they thought of that part and they were like, oh, we didn't even notice that happen. Cause there's so many, there are dancers, there's like Pyra, there's all this other stuff going on. They had no idea and they were there to see me. So if they didn't notice it, I'm sure no one did, but it felt to me like the most mortifying. Also, I limped for like two weeks after that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and there's your proof that you can have 30,000 people and no one's looking at the keyboard player. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Which, 
if anything, is just the most comforting possible it thought. Is. It is. No, great. They're two great ones, Mike. Love it. Um, so just to jump back, um, as a player, I mean, you, as you said, you've got a, you know more than 20, what, 25-year career. What, what are some of the lessons that you've learned that if you had the opportunity to pass them on to other players, what, what, what would they be? Hmm, that's a good question. That is a very wide, all-encompassing question. Um, trusting that you don't have to do so much like that you don't need so many notes you don't need like trust that if you put enough attention into the tone and the heart of the song and like just just to basically not do so much that you don't have to occupy the space with tons of notes or rhythm or anything like that it's more about like making a very musical bed you know and it's to me it's always more about warmth and tone than it is about like cool licks you know what i mean <laughs> um and i think i've gotten more like that over the years that it's become more about like restraint and good taste than it is about look at my chops you know yeah, great. and i think that's what i respect in a player as well absolutely and speaking of other players that you may respect, Mike, we do ask our guests to tag a keyboard player they'd love to hear interviewed. Is there someone that stands out? You go, you know, I'd love to find out more about their career. Oh, well, of course, I'd always love to hear from Ben Tench <laughs> or yes. uh, Patrick Warren. Um, you know, uh, two of my good friends, Max Mitchell and uh, Karina DiPiano are both people that I would love to hear on this show. Karina right. played uh, in Troy's band for a while as well. And I know she's played with a lot of other people, Rita Ora, um, and right. who else? But yeah, she's done a lot of stuff. She'd be great. Noted. And on, on those first two suggestions, I won't believe it until it's in the can, but one of those two names you mentioned at the front there are um, uh, hopefully coming on the show in the next couple of months. Oh, amazing. So, so I'll, I'll believe it when it happens. Mike, okay. when, fingers crossed. Amazing. Um, yeah, so very excited about that. So, no, thank you. They're, they're great ones, and we'll definitely follow those up. Um, and then the dreaded Desert Island Discs question, five, oh five albums you couldn't live without. Oh, boy. So I was trying to figure out how to frame this question mentally for myself, and I was like, is this albums that – this is what I asked myself. Is this albums that I feel like, you know, if uh, that I couldn't live without or albums that changed – changed me like so i'm thinking of it as albums that kind of blew my mind wide open as to what the possibilities are in music because for me that was there are some very specific answers hold on let me well, i could probably remember them anyway um i would say the first one and you might notice that these are all kind of late 90s early 2000s and i think that's probably because that's that was my formative Mm. And that was like when I was at Berkeley, that was when I first graduated from college. And it's interesting how those formative albums really stay with you, you know? Um, so one of mine, these might all be really obvious answers, um, but one of them is, is OK Computer by Radiohead. Um, I heard that the same week I heard one of my other answers, which is Homogenic by Bjork. Uh, I heard those both of those albums for the first time in the same week uh, and this was right near my the beginning of my career at berkeley and i just didn't know you could do that you know in in both cases they like just blew my brain wide open to like what an album can be to what an artist can be to how how you can say something so strongly you know like I still listen to homogenic now and it still sounds like it's something from 30 years in the future, even today. And I like, I don't know how she does that. <laughs> it's just being a visionary, I guess. Um, but I'm still astounded by the artistry of that. And I, I still am astounded by her programming. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of press about how, because she's a woman, people assume that these men that she's brought on for like a week at the end, you know, are the ones who programmed everything and not her. Um, I think it's it's very obvious to people who love Bjork that she is the artist, that she is the one who is creating all of this, that these sounds are coming from her, that this programming is coming from her. 
I mean, it's incredible. And so as a music synthesis major at the time, I was obsessed. Like the very first thing you hear that song, Hunter, um, you know, just the, the programming of the drums on that, how it's like, it's sort of like this 8080 snare, but she's, she, this was 2000, no, this was 1997, I think. She was automating like the attack and release times of the snare and things like that. They're like, I hadn't heard someone do that before, you know, where the snare is just getting longer and shorter and it just is all breathing in a really organic way that I just was like, oh, wow, you can, you can play synth and make it feel like this organism that's alive, you know? So that was, I think, the first thing that taught me that. OK Computer, of course, was like, I mean, I don't know where you start with that yeah, one, but that's also that's where I kind of learned the, that you could make a self-contained sort of journey like that. Um, that was probably where my obsession with like the album format began, I would say. Um, I released a concept album of my own in 2007, and I think it all probably started from OK Computer from, you know, and now I'm, I'm so sad that now we have singles and it's kind of all people have the attention span for because I still very much love a concept album, you know? Um, okay, let's see what else. Uh, okay, also around the same time, Tori Amos. Uh, so I first heard Little Earthquakes when I was in like seventh grade and I was on like a youth retreat with a church. And I, I was, we were in uh, New Jersey at the boardwalk and I went into a music store and I saw this album and I asked my friend about it and they were like, oh yeah, I heard that's pretty naughty. I heard there's some stuff on there. And I was like, what do you mean? And so, and, but I knew she was a piano player and I was like, Look, I guess I kind of relate. So I just bought it. And I remember listening to this on this church, church bus retreat, like with all the kids around me singing all these like songs about Jesus. And then I was just listening to this, this Tori Amos album and thinking like, Ooh, this is scandalous. Um, but I also really related to her sense of feeling like she didn't belong and feeling like she was in this environment that was everything around her, but it wasn't her, you know? And so I think that was very informative to me. And my album that I would choose for her is actually her second one, Under the Pink. Um, because again, still brilliant. I listened to it recently, still sounds incredible now, but uh, her her piano playing is still, to me, like one of my biggest influences, like just the, the delicacy of it and all the little like uh, ornaments that she throws in, like has informed the way I play so much that I kind of feel like I'm ripping her off some of the time still, even though I don't listen to her that much now, it's like, it's just in there, you know? That's a compliment, not a rip off mic. It's a compliment. Okay, that's what we'll say. We'll say we'll say it's a compliment. Um, but yeah, I, it was so formative because it was I was learning classical piano at the time and loving pop music and seeing how she was weaving those things together. Um, and her her next album after Under the Pink. Um, uh, oh, now why can't I think of the name? The one with the pig on the front. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also am obsessed with that one because it just boundaries were being crossed and where I didn't even know there were boundaries, you know, I felt like there was a lot of that going on with Bjork and Radiohead and Tori Amos and all these artists in the late nineties that were really like pushing frontiers and probably didn't know they were, they were just making art, you know? Um, okay. Wait, what do I have two more left? You do. Okay. Uh, Sufi and Stevens come on, feel the Illinois. Oh, I know. I, we're, we're kindred spirits. Yeah, no, I, keep going. Just that's a yeah, incredible album. Again, a concept album, a, a very long, sweeping concept album. My favorite thing. Um, and again, his his sensibilities, like just top to bottom, incredible writing, incredible production, crossing boundaries again in terms of like instrumentation, in terms of uh, that song, John Wayne Gacy Jr is to this day, one of my favorite songs ever. And just to like find empathy in a serial killer, like in the way that he does, it gives you chills. Um, yeah, I just- Mike, have you ever seen him play live? Believe it or not, no. <laughs> I can't because believe I, that I've I had haven't. the privilege. Yeah, I've had the privilege in, of all places at the Sydney Opera House. And it was, I think it was something like a 12 piece band. But it, it is literally one of the most incredible shows I've ever seen in my lifetime. Yeah, it's just amazing. 
I would love to see him play live. Yes, I can't believe I haven't done it. And you know what? I've never seen Radiohead play live. I've never seen Bjork play live. And I've never seen Tori Amos play live. And I think there is a theme here <laughs> that I'm terrified to see my heroes. But uh, I think that I should. I think at least one of them. I should pick one and do it. <laughs> and then I was going to say for the for the last slot there. Um, OK, I, can I make it a tie? Yes, please. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cheat. I'm cheating. Um, so one of them would be Sam Phillips, Martinis and Bikinis. I don't know if you're familiar familiar with that. Um, but that's like a Chad Blake mix. And just her songs and Chad Blake's mix, there was something very dangerous about it. When I heard it the first time, it was like 94 it came out. That mix still, when I listen to it, it's like there are places where intentionally the vocal is mixed just slightly too low. And, you know, you're intended to lean forward and you know, the, the slap back on the drums is louder than the drums. And it feels like a weird sort of drug odyssey. Um, but the first time I heard that mix, I was just blown away. I was like, I didn't know you could break the rules like that, you know? And now I know there are no rules, but at the time I just was like, wow, like just the first, that first song, Martinis and Bikinis, and then there's this fill going into the second song that just sounds like everything fell apart. And it's like, immediately, you know, you're in for something crazy, you know? So, okay, that, and then I felt like I should pick something fairly recent. So Phoebe Bridgers, Punisher, love it, obsessed. I love that she's picking up the mantle for uh, Elliot Smith, you know, all Great of that. Peaks. Love Great it. peaks. And Mike, I've been remiss, and I did have it here to to ask you. You mentioned about your own concept album because you you've had a burgeoning solo career yourself, and I think is it seven albums you've now released. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not so, sure. Yeah, so I mean, that's obviously got to be a big source of creative satisfaction for you. And and what I haven't mentioned to our audience um, is the incredible singing voice you yourself have. So you know, have you got something else on the boil in that respect? Oh, well, first of all, thank you. And that to me has always been like, I feel like I'm happiest in life when I'm creating. So whether I'm playing with other artists or not, I feel like I have to be making things all the time. And even if I, at some point no one will listen to them, that's okay. I still have to make them for me. Um, but yeah, so I've made a lot of solo albums. I did a kids album. I did the concept album. I did a, uh, what else? Uh, well, I, I recently did one that has over 3 million plays on Spotify. Uh, and that was probably the most, the most popular streaming release I've done. So I do plan on doing more, but it's always kind of like, I'm just making stuff until I decide to tie it together as an album or to release it as a single. So right now there's just a bunch of half finished stuff everywhere. That must but have they, been, that must have been really um, gratifying the three million streams on Spotify, even just to get that $12 check in the mail. Must have been, <laughs> it must have been, it must yes. have been a great thing. Yes, one dinner was, was very nice to have that one dinner um, on Spotify. But yeah, like I do a lot of um, like features for EDM DJs and things like that too. So they'll send me a track, like some, a, a Dutch DJ will send me a track and you know, I love that kind of stuff because you can just write it in an afternoon and then, you know, two years later it comes out and you're like, oh, I forgot about that song. Um, but yeah, I've had some success with that, uh, with like Cosmic Gate. There's some trans artists like that that I've been working with. And um, yeah, it's I just feel like I do get bored fairly easily. And so I try to do different things. And then when I get bored of that, I do something else. And then when I get bored of that, I do something else. So oh, yeah. Great. No, excellent. And, and we'll obviously be linking to your albums in the show notes. So, yeah, no, de definitely worth a check out. I've enjoyed a lot of that. Um, and then our last question, Mike, uh, we do what's called a quick fire 10. So these are 10 questions related to keyboard players where if not, a, you, you just need to choose the answer or give a minimal response where appropriate. So here we go. Um, stereo or mono? Stereo. Sitting or standing? Standing. I would expect no less from, from yourself and the shows you play. I can't imagine you getting away with sitting. You know what? Uh, I've thought about this recently because I'm getting older and I want to sit, but you can't play a show like that no, sitting down. No. Um, Kita, sexy or an abomination? Oh, boy. Well, I am guilty of this. I, I was I was one of the people who like promoted the Roland Kitar when it came back in 2007 or eight or whenever that was. 
And now I feel like they've gone the route of Coldplay where like no one will say anything positive about them, but I still think they're a little bit cool. Yep. I think you can get away with it, Mike. I think that's good. (laughs) I wouldn't Um, use them in a show though. No. People would laugh at me. Um, Transpose button or adjust on the fly? Adjust on the fly. See, that's a real musician. Um, (laughs) Extend or anything else? Uh, extent for the reasons I mentioned before. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, last gig, last gig you attended as an audience member. Oh my gosh, that's a really hard question coming out of COVID because I think it's been. Oh, it's probably been. Oh no, wait, I know what it was. Caroline Polachek at the Greek Theater. Nice. Incredible. She's now on tour with like Charlie XCX, but she's such a star. I can't wait to see her get even bigger. Great. Uh, best thing about live gigs. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, just feeling, feeling that, that thing of like frequencies vibrating through a room and all experiencing it together and like getting to be a part of a feeling together, you know, that's such a special thing. Like to hear a chord, to hear a four minor chord or whatever, something beautiful ringing through a huge space with other people. There's nothing like it. Worst thing about live geeks. (laughs) um monotony um wait can i change that waiting for showtime how about that there you go (laughs) monotony of waiting for showtime yeah that can be endless yeah no great and uh one thing you'd like to see invented that make your life as a keyboard player easier Mm. i don't know i kind of feel like i have everything i need (laughs) um Mm. No, fair, fair, fair answer. And I, I do know the answer to your, the last question, I believe, Mike. Red keyboards, yes or no? Oh, yes, of course. Although, can I tell you something scandalous? Um, so w- we have, like I said, a couple backup keyboards in our Miley rig. One of them came from Ariana Grande's tour, um, and it's a Nord that she shelled entirely white. So sometimes I'm playing a Nord that's white, and it feels mean and wrong to me to be yeah, <laughs> to be that's blasphemy representing yes i want that red out there yeah no great mike can't thank you enough that was brilliant can't thank you enough for your time i, I assume well actually a, a follow-up question i assume do you have a bit of time at home now before heading out um, elsewhere on tour yeah so i think we're probably home for a few months so i'm going to start working on some solo stuff again i think and uh I, I've just started a Patreon page last year, so I'm releasing music to, uh, you know, my patrons directly that way, and that's been really fun, just being able to do that. So yeah, I'll be home in my pajamas making music, which is my favorite way to make music. Great, and um, hopefully we'll see you down in Australia again soon. I know you've been here a couple of times, and I will um, uh, sh- link people to the great travel logs you've done of previous um, Australian oh. tours on your YouTube channel. There's some great stuff there. So Thank yeah, you. hope to see you down this way again um, sometime soon. I would love to be down there. I love Australia so much. And there we have it. A huge thanks to Mike for taking part today. Um, Paul and I have said it a number of times and Mike shared another proof in the example that keyboard players are the nicest people you'd want to meet. So lovely to have Mike on and yeah, what a career he's had and is having so, um, yeah, do do check out some of the links in our show notes. Um, there, there's some incredible performances there. So once again, we'll be back in a fortnight or so, but just a reminder that we do love to hear from you and you can keep in touch via a few means. So our website is keyboardchronicles.com. Um, our Facebook page is facebook.com, the keyboard chronicles. Um, and then we're on Twitter at the keyboard CHR1. If you like good old fashioned email, then drop us a line at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. We do re- honestly love hearing from you and we thank those that do email in and give us feedback on the show. Um, if you'd like to become an official supporter, we do have a Patreon account where it does help us keep the things afloat here and, and pay for our podcast hosting and all those other important things. Um, if you'd like to chip in a few dollars a month, we'd be hugely appreciative. And that address is patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. A huge thank you to you for joining us. Um, As I said, Paul, we miss you, but we'll see you back next show. Uh, But thank you out there for listening, and we'll hope to see you back here next episode.
Dead, 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 dead.